Well, today I'm going to talk about the uh, strike trials or the sedition trials, as they're sometimes called. And uh, my name is Jim Blanchard and uh, a local historian. Now, the, um, the strike trials sort of neglected. I think there, there aren't as many books or uh, articles about the trials as there are about other things. But there are two books. One's called The Courts and the Winnipeg General Strike by Jack Walker. And that's very, very good. Jack Walker was a lawyer and he made the strike trials his hobby. And he's been dead for a while. And another man, Duncan Fraser, finished the book and sort of organized it. I know that he used to spend a lot of time in the U of M Law Library researching. The other book that has uh, quite a bit of information is uh, by Tom Mitchell, and it's called When the State Trembled, and it's more recent. There was some new archives that he was able to access in Ottawa, and so it, it has a lot of information that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, mostly, though, I use the newspapers. Okay, well, the strike, I'm going to assume that people know the basics about the strike. As soon as the um, the, the strike committee of the Winnipeg Labor Council was organized, then almost right away, the Committee of 1000 uh, announced that they were organized. The Committee of 1000 is a kind of mysterious group made up of lawyers and doctors and business people. And really, I think it was organized by the, the Board of Trade. And uh, people say, well, we nobody knows who belonged to it. And there's a couple of photographs. I think it's pretty easy to find out who was a member because for the election, the civic election in 1919, uh, there was a group called the uh, Citizens Committee. And I believe that a lot of the people on that Citizens Committee uh, had been on the Committee of a Thousand. So the usual suspects. As soon as they were organized, they started to do things to sort of thwart the strikers. Their objective was to, uh, you know, break the strike. And uh, at first, they had concentrated on getting volunteers who would take the place of striking workers. They also uh, started to uh, prepare themselves for either deportation for some of the strike leaders or else a trial. The man who kind of led this was a member of the Committee of 1000, A.J. Andrews. He was a prominent Winnipeg lawyer. He had been the mayor of Winnipeg. He was called the boy mayor because he was only in his 20s when he was elected mayor. By this time, he was a middle-aged man. So he kind of led the charge, started to organize things. They decided they needed to change the criminal code to uh, change the uh, sections in there that covered sedition. They decided sedition is what they would have the best luck with. They also went and changed to put uh, new sections into the Immigration Act. Arthur Meehan, who was the acting prime minister at this time because Robert Borden was in France at the uh, Treaty of Versailles events, uh, Arthur Meehan was the one that uh, Andrews worked with. And he got these changes through the House of Commons. In one case, he got a, a change uh, through in uh, one day, the whole thing, the three readings and getting the governor general to sign it. So anyway, um, they were preparing themselves quite early. They knew they were gonna try for uh, either uh, deporting these guys or uh, charging them. Now, the, what the change to the Immigration Act was, was to allow them to deport British subjects because most of the strike leaders that they arrested were British, British labor guys. And there were a few guys from Eastern Europe who could be easily deported because they weren't, you know, they were in a category that they could be easily deported. In the end, I think only one or two of these guys were actually deported. But the, um, the Englishman who uh, they changed the act so that it would be possible to deport them, there was Bob Russell, who, a familiar name, uh, Dick Johns, who was a friend of his. They were both machinists, iron working shops. A.A. A. Heaps, who was an alderman. John Queen was an alderman. Fred Dixon was an MLA. 
James Woodsworth at this time was just a citizen. William Ivins was a former Methodist preacher, and he had been the uh, editor of the Western Labor News. Bill Pritchard, George Armstrong was the only Canadian, native born Canadian, he was a little older, and uh, a man called Bray, who was a returned soldier. He was actually a cook in the army, and uh, he became part of the strike committee. He was kind of the liaison guy. So those are the guys, and uh, they had no idea that they were going to be arrested or anything at the beginning of the strike. When the strike had gone on for a little while, uh, in fact, on the night of June 16th to the 17th, all these people were arrested. And I'll just read to you from uh, Jack Walker's book, because he, uh, in each section, each chapter, he's talked to people because he's quoting people. And it makes it much more interesting. On June 16th, Mayor Gray announced that something big was going to happen. So he had heard that this was going to go down. There was a hurricane in the evening of June 16th. The roofs were torn off and elms went down as usual. And uh, there were hundreds of dead birds lay on the ground. So uh, watching the storm from a window in the Labor Temple, which is the one that's still there, Bill Pritchard, wondered if this was a fulfillment of the mayor's prophecy. On the night of June 16th, 17th, all these men, I've just read out their names, were arrested, plus some others, three or four uh, Eastern Europeans who were arrested in a slightly different way, and they were in the uh, column that was going to be deported. So um, about sometime after midnight, a whole bunch of specials the, the specials were the guys that they had recruited to replace the city police. Lawyers, mounted police, surrounded the Labor Temple. As the Labor Temple raid began, other officers raided the Central Hall, Ukrainian Hall, Liberty Hall, which was the Jewish uh, labor hall in the city's north end. It was not the radicals they were after, but proof needed to put them in jail. A well-known lawyer, W.P. Fillmore, recalled the events as he experienced them. And he said there were four or five of us, Chief Newton, who was the police chief, was the leader. So up we go to the door and break in the door. There was nobody there except some old man. We just proceeded to open drawers and whatever was there looked for things. There was a book by Lenin and other communist literature. I came up to a box or bench, which, I, which was locked. And I had on my wrist a short baseball bat which I gave a tremendous heave, and the door, the lid flew open, the bat flew back and hit me on the head and knocked me down. <laughs> so I was wounded in action, and I don't know if I ever got better. The officers entered by whatever means they could and quickly carried out their orders. Paper books, files were loaded into waiting drays or horses and wagons and taken away as evidence. Before turning in for the night, Bill Ivins had uh, set type for the next day's publication. His hopes were dashed. Officers armed with guns and riding whips were hanging, banging on the doors and demanding entry into several homes in and around Winnipeg, including uh, Ivans's house. The uncooperative Helen Armstrong, who was a, a well-known woman activist and who had done a lot in, during the strike, she refused to admit the police into her house until she had checked with the police station. And she went and asked the, the police uh, if this was legitimate. Uh, when she uh, came back, she um, let them in. Armed officers searched every corner shelf and drawer in her house, gathered all the books, papers, and periodicals they could find, labeled them, and placed them in cartons. And uh, then George Armstrong was arrested and taken away. When the officers knocked on Roger Bray's door, he told them to wait while he got dressed. But the men defiantly followed him into the bedroom where his wife was in her night clothes. Before arresting Ray, they combed the bedrooms of his eight children in search of seditious literature and firearms. Bob Russell was just going to bed when there was a knock on his door. His wife looked out the window and saw four or five armed men in the yard. Russell went downstairs, opened the door, and let them in. His home was searched and he was arrested. John Queen was arrested in the residence of Alderman Heaps, where he was staying while his family was at the lake. 
when the officers came to the door, Heaps raced upstairs shouting, John, John, it's you they want. The Queen came down and he took his time sauntering down the stairs. As an officer began to read the warrant, Queen interrupted. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, just a minute. He walked to the foot of the stairs and shouted, A.B., you had better come down now. It's not for me, it's for you. I'm going back to bed. The officer, slightly embarrassed, interjected, Mr. Queen, we have a warrant for your arrest as well. Of course, Queen was a bit surprised, was not a bit surprised. Oh, I was having such a lovely dream. Of all these guys, Queen was the mouthiest one. And he's, I guess he's lucky that he didn't get beat up or something. And then he, he, he writes about Mike Varenchuk, who was mistakenly arrested. He wasn't one that they wanted. So there we are. That's how they did it. And um, first they put them in a small jail, a small police station in the North End. And then they took them in cars to Stony Mountain. I have a feeling this was all illegally done because Arthur Meehan seemed to be quite worried about it. And uh, his solution was to get them deported as quickly as possible so they, there wouldn't be any embarrassment. In July, 1919, so they, they went to Stony Mountain, they stayed there, and uh, then they were on, out on bail after that. And uh, in July, there was a preliminary hearing to establish whether or not the evidence the Crown had gathered would uh, convict them. Of course, the Crown uh, lawyers were all there. Andrews, J.B. Coyne, who many years later would be uh, an official at the Bank of Canada, and uh, E.J. McMurray, who was a few years later, became a cabinet minister in Mackenzie King's cabinet. T.J. Murray, Marcus Hyman, who is a, quite an interesting character. He was a, uh, an MLA and um, a lawyer. A few years ago, there was a woman called uh, Sandy Hyman. She's still around, I see her. And she was an alderman, alderwoman. And I think that's his granddaughter. So it's an old family in Winnipeg. Central issue was whether the evidence of the Crown, which was not connected directly with the accused, should be admitted. Crown witnesses dealt at length with the silent parade and everything else, and uh, the defense repeatedly objected on grounds of irrelevancy. But the magistrate, Magistrate Noble, uh, did not agree. The accused were leaders of the strike, and the evidence of what others, sympathizers and cooperators in the strike did was admissible as far as he was concerned. So that's not a surprise that the magistrate was on the side of the Crown. The jurors were selected as the first step in the trial. So the trial, the, they divided the, uh, the trials up. First, they tried Bob Russell, and uh, I'm not sure why they chose to try him alone. He was a prominent leader, and I guess they used his trial as a test case to see how it went. But the, the jurors were chosen uh, for uh, Russell's trial in a, an unusual way. Th this is highly illegal, the way this was done. Uh, Andrews was given a list of the potential jurors. There was all, there's always a list of, of potential jurors to fill the 12 seats on the jury. And uh, then he assigned the Northwest Mounted Police and members of the McDonald Detective Agency to administer a questionnaire to all these people to find out who was the most likely to be uh, favorable to the Crown. Tom Mitchell found evidence of this. And um, in Jack Walker's book, when he was doing research, he talked to J.T. Thorson, who again was a person who later on in his life became a liberal cabinet minister and a judge. And, but at the time he was a young lawyer who was one of the Crown lawyers. And he was, uh, told uh, Walker that, that the trials of the strike leaders left him with an abiding sense of shock, that it was possible to pack a jury in such a way that there was no possibility of acquittal. So there we have hard evidence that, because um, he's a reputable guy, and he was shocked by the way they packed the jury. During the jury selection, it was obvious that uh, the judge was going to favor Andrews. Justice Metcalf was the judge. And if you read the accounts of the sessions of the trials, uh, he always upholds Andrews' objections. 
and he very seldom does that for the labor lawyers, the team of lawyers that the labor group had hired. But he wasn't as bad as he sometimes painted. He had a sense of humor. He wanted things to go correctly so there wouldn't be any retrials. The um, trial started with first witness, F.E. Langdale, who was an informer for the Northwest Mounted Police, and he was at various meetings. The Crown focused on four or five meetings that took place in Winnipeg and Calgary before the strike was called. There was a meeting in the Walker Theater, which was in December of 1918, at which the, the focus of the meeting was withdrawing Canadian troops from Russia, because at that time, the Russian Civil War was ongoing and there were Canadian troops there. And also, there was the issue of orders in council, which during the war, the cabinet passed a lot of orders in council. By now, the war is over, and they should have been canceled, or contents of the orders in council should have been moved into regular legislation. And that was happening. But they were still operating with orders in council, which were kind of harsh in many cases. So the Walker Theater meeting, that was the reason for it. Sam Blumenberg, who was another one of the labor leaders who were involved in the strike and who probably would have been sent out of the country, except that he left sometime during this period and moved to Chicago, where he lived for the rest of his life. At the Walker Theater meeting, he was wearing a red scarf and a red pocket handkerchief. And he said, he announced, I wear this scarf to show and show this handkerchief so that there will be no mistake about where I stand. He, the uh, Mountie, had taken notes about what everybody said. John Queen was quoted, oppression and anarchy go hand in hand. I stand for Bolshevism. It stands for liberty, democracy, and fraternity. At this time, the Russian Revolution was fairly new. I don't think they honestly knew what the Bolsheviks were really doing, but who knows? There are still people around who think the Bolsheviks were great. There was a Calgary convention, which the uh, Western labor leaders called, because when they went to the national convention of the Canadian Labor Congress, they were always voted down. So they decided to have their own convention. And it was at this Calgary convention that the first steps were taken to set up the one big union, which was uh, happening at the same time as the strike. The Crown tried to connect the one big union with the Winnipeg general strike, but uh, they weren't that successful. There really wasn't a strong connection. It's just they were happening at the same time. The one big union was an industrial union, which meant it was an overarching organization. It's more common in Great Britain, but um, and the, there was one in the States too, the International Workers of the World. They saw the general strike as one of the most potent weapons. So they were talking about a national general strike at the same time. So things got kind of confusing. The story of the OBU is uh, that it did really well. It had a lot of members at the, around the time of the strike and shortly after. And then employers in Winnipeg refused to deal with the OBU. They wanted to only deal with the, uh, the craft unions and the trade unions that were the traditional organizations. So in the end, uh, the only group that had the OBU as their, uh, as their real union was, were the streetcar conductors. It was more a lot of testimony by police informers. And my question is, how did they make these notes if they were in a crowd of people in a theater? How did they make notes <laughs> and not get thrown out? You know, the, the defense lawyers several times during the trials brought up that the, this is just hearsay. It's written down by these police informers who needed something to report. I mean, they were being paid to be informers. So, so their, their evidence is they tried to call the evidence into question but they didn't get away with that. The judge wouldn't hear of it. So as we move on towards the um, towards Christmas, uh, it was announced that 
F.J. Dixon and James Woodsworth would uh, be tried after the end of the Russell trial, after Christmas. The, they were charged with something different, not sedition, but seditious libel. And that's because when uh, Ivans, who was the editor of the uh, Strike Bulletin, was arrested, they went in and brought out more issues of the Strike Bulletin, just a few. And uh, Dixon wrote two editorials. One was called Bloody Saturday, and the other one was called Kaiserism in Canada. So he was the inventor of those terms, which you often hear. And they were charged uh, for that. It was announced that their trials were coming up, and they were both intending to defend themselves without the help of a lawyer. This was sort of unusual at the time. There was a man called Cassidy who was a lawyer from Vancouver, and he was brought here by the Trades and Labor Council to uh, head up the defense. He didn't get along with Judge Metcalf. He was a little mouthy, and Judge Metcalf, uh, you know, they, they didn't get along very well. On one occasion, the judge said, I hope you will not assume that I am hostile. And Cassidy answered him, oh no, my lord, I know that there's nothing personal between us, <laughs> replied Cassidy. And then he continued. Later, the judge Metcalf said, for God's sake, can't I get, a, get to say anything? He demanded the justice when he got a word in. Another time, Justice Metcalf said, Mr. Cassidy, I haven't gotten angry with you yet, but for heaven's sake, let me alone, especially when I'm favorable to you. And Cassidy answered, I only wanted to finish a sentence. And Metcalf said, I don't believe you can finish a sentence. <laughs> there were some moments at another point during the Russell trial, uh, McMurray, one of the labor lawyers, charged in court that the Committee of a Thousand was itself seditious, saying it was a capitalistic organization that had its inception in a certain clique formed in 1918 for the purpose of crushing labor. He said the evidence the Crown was, had submitted uh, had come from a biased source, influenced by the Committee of a Thousand. He said statements published in the Citizen newspaper, which was the anti-strike newspaper, which was published during the strike, were false. Metcalf said that there was a grand jury and the court if McMurray wanted to accuse the committee of anything. McMurray said that the assertions about his client had been biased. I contend there has been a widespread conspiracy to crush labor. And I, you know, I think he's right, but Metcalf didn't want to, you know, get off track, I guess, uh, or even you know, get into that question. Russell it was on the stand for quite a while and he, he defended himself. He maintained that the strike was about collective bargaining and wages. The two shops, the contract shops, there were, Canadian Northern and CPR shops, metal working shops. And uh, the men in those shops got paid more money than the uh, men in these contract shops, which were owned, didn't belong to the railroads. They just did contract work in the first war. Uh, these shops did a lot of, made a lot of shell casings, for example. Uh, there was, uh, the guys in the contract shops in Winnipeg were paid 13 cents an hour lower than the, the railroad employees. They had, hadn't had a raise in a while. The owners of the contract shops who owned the uh, Vulcan Ironworks, the Manitoba Bridge, and the Dominion Bridge, they were quite aggressive about not negotiating with unions. They had, in the past decade or so, they had broken a lot of strikes by bringing in trainloads of strike breakers. It was like war on the streets. The, the issue was, for the general strike, the issue was that the unions had to form themselves into uh, organizations. There were the, the metal shop workers and there were also the uh, building trades workers. And uh, they were, the, the workers were all uh, represented by the carpenters union, the bricklayers union, the, the machinists union and so the um, workers had organized themselves into uh, 
these councils and they wanted the owners to negotiate with the councils and the owners refused. So Russell did a good job really of explaining what he was really up to and uh, it wasn't really overthrowing the state. He was on the strike committee and they were interested in collective bargaining, improving uh, conditions and wages. So he met all the charges and uh, explained uh, his point of view. Much of the questioning of Russell was about the principles of the Socialist Party because he was a leader of the Socialist Party of Canada in Winnipeg. He had a lot of literature that had been seized. So quoting from the literature, Andrews said, much of the propaganda was aimed at inciting revolt. This was denied by Russell. He declared that the object of the socialists was an instructive one to educate workers so that they will be able to analyze society in preparation for the change from capitalism to collectivism. Russell gave long involved answers to Andrews's questions and Andrews said, you haven't answered one of my questions directly. <laughs> and Metcalf said, the judge said, that perhaps if the questions were not so involved, the answers would not be so involved. So there were moments when uh, Metcalf scolded Andrews. There was a lot about the OBU because Russell had been a major mover and shaker in setting up the OBU, the one big union. Andrews, the son of a Methodist minister, criticized the moral shortcomings of the strike leaders, their lack of respect for religion, their attacks on the family. All this must have caused Judge Metcalf some amusement. Metcalf had had a romantic affair with Andrews's wife, and on one occasion, Andrews had thrown the judge down the stairs during an argument. <laughs> Andrews himself tolerated the affair and had a mistress who lived in his house with himself and his wife. This is something that John, that uh, Tom Mitchell found out somehow. I don't have the footnote in front of me. Okay, so uh, on uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, he uh, learned that he had been found guilty. The jury came back and said he was guilty of sedition. And on uh, December 27th, he was sentenced to two years in prison. That was a larger, that was a longer sentence than anybody else got. Anybody else got one year a case of Bray, I think he got six months. So he must have been seen as a as the ringleader. I don't know that he really was. Anyway, after Christmas, on uh, January 20th, there was the second assizes, so-called assizes of the courts. They were two things going on at that in that time period after January 20th. One was the trial of the remaining seven people who uh, had been arrested. So if Russell's trial was a uh, dry run, then all the rest of them were going to be tried together because for one thing, it, it had taken a long time to get through Russell's trial. If you times that by seven, they'd be uh, in the courtroom until the following year, following Christmas. So they tried them together. Of the group that, that was there, A.A. A. Heaps, who was an alderman, he announced that he was going to uh, defend himself. I think uh, John Queen, who was also an alderman at that time, he said he was going to speak for himself. Pritchard uh, wasn't really from Winnipeg. He, he was, had come here from Edmonton, I think. He made a statement to the um, jury and Dixon. Fred Dixon, but he wasn't tried with the others. He was tried by himself. So we'll find out what happened to these guys at the end. But uh, if we look at um, Cassidy went back to Vancouver because I think it was considered that he hadn't done a great job. The first four days of this trial for the seventh men was taken up with motions and counter motions and arguments. A.A. Heaps, very aggressive and he knew uh, the rules. He made a motion to disbar the whole prosecution team <laughs> and uh, who were charged to, to be of such extreme partiality that it will be impossible to get a fair trial. Metcalf said the only way he knows to remove the Crown lawyers is to have them disbarred. <laughs> they were again A.J. Andrews and now we have uh, Isaac Pipledo 
and uh, his law firm is still around, J.B. Coyne, W.A. Sweatman, and S.L. Goldstein, all of whom except Goldstein had connections with the Committee of a Thousand. So that's how it started. He's uh, sort of letting them know that he wasn't going to be trifled with. So it was like a repeat of the um, Russell trial. He went through all the same things and uh, the way the jury was picked was the same. In uh, the case of uh, Dixon's trial, the uh, Crown lawyers were Hugh Phillips, who uh, lived quite a long time. He was still around in the 70s, I think. J.T. Thorson, who was, uh, we've already mentioned him. He was very young at this time. On the defense side, uh, Hugh Cutler, was assigned to, to uh, defend Dixon, but he, he didn't actually do too much, and finally he just left. The judge was Judge Galt, Justice Galt. Galt was a uh, relative of Alexander Galt, who was one of the fathers of Confederation, and uh, there were other Galts living in Winnipeg. He was uh, known to have a bad temper, but during this trial, uh, I didn't see any signs of that. He was strict. He, he kept them on the straight and narrow. He wouldn't uh, pull away on side issues. When the trial of Dixon was over, he complimented him on, and he said that it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible for Dixon to find a lawyer in Winnipeg who could have done a better job. <laughs> so Dixon was, of course, he was a politician. He was used to speaking in public, and also he had uh, studied up for this. Uh, this trial. He had spent time with various lawyers in the city, and at one point he went up to Bertle to uh, stay in the house of uh, Judge Stubbs. He wasn't a judge then, he was a lawyer, but and Stubbs spent a lot of time with Dixon, made him practice, gave him tips. You know, as a result, uh, Dixon did a good job of defending himself. Now, Phillips defined seditious libel as conduct which has for an object the incitement of ill will, disturbance, and in general, anything that tends to promote public disorder. So it sounds a little loosey-goosey. He said it was hard to define, <laughs> but any words which tended to promote the unlawful association or assemblies and would in the end encourage a forceful obstruction against the execution of law was seditious libel. So that's what he's charged with. He tried to tie the Winnipeg general strike to the national general strike talked about at the Calgary meeting. He said labor leaders in Winnipeg simply decided to start the, the strike early. No evidence for that. Phillips said that you can't quarrel with the lawful aspirations of labor, but he will show that the aspirations of the strikers, strikers in May and June were not lawful. And if an article is written for the purpose of alienating the affections of the people and bringing those in authority into disrepute, it is seditious and therefore punishable. So these are the same kind of arguments we've seen Andrews making. Dixon took charge of this defense and Hugh Cutler, who was to have assisted him, withdrew. So Dixon uh, examined Crown witnesses. One was Langdale, the, the mounted police spy. Dixon asked about the crowd's reaction to the resolutions at the Walker Theater meeting. It was described. Evidence about a meeting of the board in the Board of Trade auditorium at which speeches were made and socialist literature was sold. Dixon was not at this meeting and Dixon objected, but the judge allowed it because a connection might be made later. And he did that in other cases too. So again, we, they depended heavily on the notes that the Mounties made at these various meetings, which seems to be pretty thin, thin evidence. At this time, at the time that Dixon was uh, being tried, uh, the influenza pandemic was very bad in Toronto. There were 10,000 cases in the city. So that sounds familiar, eh? Now, the case went on for five days, and there were eight witnesses. Dixon said he might not call any witnesses at all. The judge called F.G. Perry, the court reporter from Fernie, who had been hired by Labour to record the Calgary Convention. Once again, they, they read out at these meetings, it was common to send greetings to the Soviet government, which um, 
what people did in those days, the first, the first days before things got bad, I guess. The um, Phillips called witnesses to show the general strike was illegal. He goes back to the Calgary meeting once again. They had seized a lot of letters from Russell's house, letters to other Western socialists to show that, and they read these out in court to show that these men were planning to hijack the Calgary meeting to begin a movement to use general strikes nationally on June 1st if the resolutions for a six hour day, release of political prisoners, lifting the ban on radical literature, bring home the troops from Russia were not complied with. So those were the issues they were working on, bring home the troops from Russia. There were people in jail at this time uh, under an order in council for things that they had said, seditious remarks. Dixon objected to using letters that did not mention him to try and convict him. They show conspiracy, but he was indicted for a seditious libel. Justice Gauld actually said, if he is guilty of conspiracy, then what is he doing in this courtroom? Dixon didn't call any witnesses, which gave him the right to speak last, which is a good place to be in. So Phillips made his address to the jury. He accused Dixon of um, agreeing with the Crown because he didn't call witnesses. He lectured Dixon, he said, when he was at the Walker Theater meeting, that Dixon, as a member of the legislature, should have got up and walked out. He should have also objected to the idea of sending readings to the Soviet Russia. So Dixon began his statement at 2.30 p.m. and he talked for seven hours. The Woodsworth trial was postponed because there weren't enough courtrooms. So Woodsworth was waiting for the end of Dixon's trial. Dixon said that um, it took two weeks to read seditious intent into his articles, but he says there was none there in the first place. He said that there was no conspiracy, but even if there was, he was not part of it. Speaking of the title of Kaiserism in Canada and Bloody Saturday, he said a strong word here or there was not seditious. It is the intention behind the articles that is seditious or not. Dixon attacked the Crown for unfair tactics in submitting unconnected evidence to becloud the issue. Dixon said single sentences had been isolated from the text in order to distort their significance. He did well, it was a good, it was a good talk. At, uh, at, at some points he stood next to the jury box and looked the jurymen in the eye. Now, once again, the jury was made up mostly of farmers, and, uh, but Dixon himself was a farmer. And it's sort of surprising, but he did have a farm up in Rosser municipality, and he uh, did uh, make presentations at the United Grain Growers conventions. So some of these farmers may have actually known him, but that wasn't mentioned. So Dixon did a good job of criticizing the Crown Councils, the tactics they used. Dixon, uh, the jury went out and the, the jury came back and Dixon was acquitted. And as a result, the Crown didn't, continue, didn't pursue the charges against Woodsworth. They dropped the charges, except for the charge of seditious utterance. And that hung over his head for many, many years while he was an MP and uh, so on. His seven hour address was being called the most eloquent plea ever heard in a Manitoba court. He argued for freedom of opinion. He told the jury that as an individual, it did not matter whether he went to jail or not, but if he was convicted, every man in Canada whose opinion differed from the government in power was threatened with arrest. He asked the jury to defend the liberty of the people. They voted 11-1 for Dixon's release and the last man joined the majority on Monday morning. The courtroom was packed on Monday and they burst into cheers when the first not guilty was given by the foreman. And of course, Judge Galt threatened to clear the court if people didn't quiet down. Galt congratulated Dixon and warned him against participating in such transactions in the future. <laughs> Galt's charge to the jury went over everything again. 
but he did pay Dixon the compliment of saying that he did very well. On the very same day in the, uh, in the evening, he went to the legislature because he was an MLA. And uh, there in the evening session, he asked the Attorney General Johnson who paid for the trials, who was were the Crown lawyers reporting to. What kind of a trial was this? Because this was all secret. Uh, it was me and uh, Arthur Mia that had given them the status of temporary Crown federal prosecutors. But it wasn't very clear until some time later. The prisoners, uh, the, the seven men, were given a sentences of one year. They went back to the Vaughn Street Jail where they had been held. And then um, during the summer, they were uh, sent to a prison farm, which was down in the White Shell, somewhere near the Ontario border. And I'm pretty sure that I've heard that uh, there are still some buildings there, or remains of buildings. Labor groups raised a lot of money to, to support the families of these men while they were in jail. Heaps went on an extensive lecture tour, including uh, making speeches in the United Kingdom. In the provincial elections of 1920, in the civic elections, Armstrong, Ivins, Queen, and Dixon was re-elected. Armstrong, Ivins, and Queen were in jail, but they had been elected to serve in the uh, city council, I think, and also in the uh, legislature. 40% of the vote went to labor candidates. All the prisoners were candidates in some place or other. So there was a big upsurge in support for labor politicians. It died down a little bit, but that was the beginning of the independent labor party and um, all the predecessors of the CCF. You know, they, they didn't have a majority in the city council or in the legislature, but they were always present. You know, I think you could say they asked the best questions. And then in the mid twenties, Woodsworth, and um, heaps were elected as MPs. And so there was a, a Labour Party presence in the House of Commons. Andrews continued to be a prominent lawyer. And uh, the first thing he did in 1920 was argue that he should be paid more money than uh, it looked like he was going to be paid. So he, in the end, he was paid $32,623. It later received $26,990. That James Coyne received $21,587. And I'm not sure what the others got, but the, these enormous payments were, uh, the money was taken out of the funds that had been appropriated for programs for returned soldiers, you know, to pay for training and so on. So that's the story. Step back <coughs> a little bit when the men were, uh, seven men, were given their sentence of a year. The, uh, the judge, Judge Metcalf, cleared the courtroom so that the wives and children of these men could come in and have a few minutes to say goodbye. This was described as a very touching scene. That's it. That's the trials. And uh, of course, there's a tremendous amount of detail that I've left out, but you get the general idea of how the Crown tried to, to convict these men and how um, in a few cases individuals were able to uh, convince the jury to acquit them. So thanks for listening.